Alright, hello guys, welcome. Um, can you guys hear me in the back? Thumbs up? Yeah? Yeah. Alright, cool. Um, so yeah, welcome to 6.48 day 2. Uh, my name is Charles, I was here yesterday, but um, so hello, welcome. Um, there's a couple other um, of the staff members who also weren't here yesterday um, that you probably would like to meet. Um, so who was here yesterday? Xander? Steph? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, Eva? Hi. Um, so yeah, so now you've met everyone. Cool. Um, and yeah, so if you ever, you know, um, want any help with your website or just want to talk about life or whatever, um, just come down here. Um, we're more than happy to talk to you about whatever whatever it is that, that's on your mind. Um, cool. So today we're going to get into a lot more of the details when it comes to actually building a website. Um, and I just thought I wanted to go back to this graph, because I think it's amazing. Um, when, we, when we made this graph last year, we were just like, oh my god, this, this is really funny. Um, and in addition to it really showing the amount of work that was done over the course of a month, um, I think one thing that it also really reflects on is how frustrated people were with their computers over the course of that month. Um, in that the more work people tried to do, the more they realized that whatever framework they were using or whatever they were trying to do was just not like working correctly and stuff like that. Um, and that's all normal, especially if this is your first time making a website. Um, things can get overwhelming a little bit quickly. Um, and that's our job, to help you make this as painless as possible. So I just wanted to remind you all one more time, office hours start tomorrow. Um, there's always Piazza, help us beat our record last year a four minute average response time. Um, and just in general, ask us for help, email us, ask on Piazza, whatever, um, whatever it might take to help you become less frustrated and less confused and actually you know, be able to be productive and get work done. Cool. So as I said today, um, we're gonna finally look at some code. We're not gonna look at code yet. Um, I'm mostly gonna talk at you for the better part of an hour um, with some of the last little bits of background information that we need. Um, and then we're actually going to dive into a web framework and we're going to see a website in action. It'll be really exciting. And I'll throw things at you and it'll be really exciting. Uh, so yeah, uh, throughout the course of the lecture, let me, let me know how you're doing. Um, if you just go to that website, there's one question on there. It's basically, how confused are you? And if you answer that question, I'll um, know to either speed up or slow down and adjust the pace accordingly. Um, can someone unlock that? Cool. So I hope you're all excited. So before we can really make a website, what we really want to talk about is how, how are these websites structured? When you go to your favorite website, you know, what is the structure of the code that underlies that website? Um, how do you, on your computer, talk to, talk to a website, talk to a server, you know, thousands of miles away? And ultimately, you know, hopefully we're gonna to get to the question, how do you actually make this website? And how do you make the website in a way that's really as painless as possible. So, um, start with a little, little bit of a history lesson. Um, you got to see this man yesterday, Tim Berners-Lee, 1989, um, was, is considered the founder of the, what we consider to be websites um, and the World Wide Web today. Right? And if you read the things that he wrote, you can actually go onto the that site if you're interested, and there's a replica of the first set of web pages that ever existed on the internet. Um, and you can see he had really lofty goals. You know, he wanted the web to be this information retrieval, information storage network that was connected. And through these connections, people would be able to explore, you know, more and more content. And in some ways, that's how we use the internet today, and in a lot of ways, that's really not how we use the internet at all. Um, but at, at the core of what Tim Berners-Lee invented was simply that we would find a way to display these documents, these documents made of markup languages, like HTML, uh, which we'll see today and tomorrow and for the rest of your life, um, connected with hyperlinks. And that really forms the backbone of the web as we know it. Um, the connectivity and actions that you can take to go from page to page uh, really enable the web to be what it is. 
So this happened in you know, 89, 90 in Switzerland. And over the next decade or so, uh, popularity of the web really increases. And you might, you know, recognize sites from your youth that look something like that, uh, filled with obnoxious audio and marquees and flashing banners and um, whatever you, else you guys used to do on your MySpace profile pages and stuff like that. You know, everyone, when they were 13, thought they were elite hackers um, by copying snippets of HTML into their MySpaces. Uh, and just as a little throwback, if you go to that page, you can type in any current website and it'll make it look like it was a site done in GeoCities in the 90s. Um, as, as a counterpoint, if your site actually looks like that, please, please fix it. Um, we, will, we will be very sad if we see a site that looks like that. Cool. So, it turns out that a lot of the sort of technical details and things that really made the web happen back in the 90s are still relevant today, right? The web at its core is still this network that distributes content, right? So, back in, back in the day, we had this system of distributing these pages across the network. We invented the browser, and the browser was nothing more at that point than a window into the World Wide Web. It loaded content and it displayed it to the user, and it allowed the user to do the most basic um, interactions. It let you basically click on links. All right. And we wrote the first web server, Tim Berners-Lee did in 1990, um, that was the simplest of servers. It was a simple request response model where you had a server that just sat there, and someone would connect to it. It would serve a request, and life would move on. You know, that turns out that's pretty much how we access the web today, right? We, as a client, we send a request to a server. So the first thing that happens when we send a request to a server is our browser needs to say, okay, I go to this web page, skcd.com. What, where is the computer that holds this web page? So the first thing that the server needs to do is it needs to translate skcd.com into an address. Right. Does anyone know what the service that does that is called? Yeah. DNS, exactly. You got chocolate. Uh, DNS, domain name service. It's this world, world, worldwide connected network of computers that simply does this translation from names to addresses. Right. So we, now we say, the browser says, okay, well, we're at this address now, that's cool, let me send a request to it to fetch the contents of this page, and what happens? So here's where we take a little break from our typical diagram of the arrows going back and forth, and let's take a deeper view, you know, still a very, a very high level view of what's going on in the server. Right? This is our example of the really dumb server, where there's this box sitting there. And it's doing these four things indefinitely. All right. The server just sits there. Someone connects to it. You know, I go on my computer. I connect to it. It does something with my connection, and then it closes it. And in our extremely oversimplified world, all it's really doing is it's finding a file and sending it back to me. Does that make sense? So it's really really the underpinning of all of web, basically, is that a server just sits there, we connect to it, and it sends us back something. And what is it that it sends back? Well, the server doesn't care what it sends back. It, what it sends back is determined by what we, as the user, want, and what we can understand. So, you know, today, our browsers understand things like HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and so that's what the server is going to send back to us. <coughs> But, so the critical thing here to note is that the server is actually really dumb in our oversimplified model. The server is simply this thing that takes our request and sends us back something that it considers to be text, and we're responsible for making sense of it. And there we have a client server, probably the most successful architecture in computer systems that we've ever come up with. 
right? Client server, if you haven't taken 6033, you've probably heard Ron's talk for days about client server. Um, you know, strong modularity, um, simul simultaneous connections, we can do a lot of things with it. But that's client server in a nutshell, and that's how the web works at a really high level. Cool, any questions? Give me any responses to this thing. Uh, I'll let you figure it out. Cool. So, any questions so far? Alright. So, you say, okay, Charles, that's, that's really cool. You know, I can get these static pages back from websites now, but this is clearly not what we have today. Well, what do we have today, right? Things like Facebook. Google. We have services that run on the internet, like PayPal. So, what is it that is different? And this is where you guys shout out answers, or raise your hand and then shout out answers. Um, what, it is, what is it that is different between the model of the web that we had in the 90s and what we have today? Interaction, exactly. That's, that's one. Scale, exactly. <laughs> Not me. Right there. But this notion of who you are, right? Like cookies being stored so the website really recognizes who you are. Right, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about cookies and personalization you know, throughout this course. Um, but personalization, cookies, the concept of the user. Um, nice. sure. um, yeah, right here. The content is static. <coughs> The content is dynamic. Very good. Yeah. More advertising. I'll give you that. <laughs> and you know, advertising really comes from a lot of these other technologies that we'll discover. Um, any other ideas? Anyone familiar with the term big data? Or um, the disruptive cloud, or any of those buzzwords strung together in every startup's pitch. <laughs> so, so, you know, I last night I decided that the sort of revolution of the web came in about four, approximately four characteristics. So, someone mentioned your dynamic web applications, right? No longer are we just looking at static pages, but we can go to the same page and get different results, right? If I go to Facebook.com and you go to Facebook.com, we're going to get very different results. And that's simply something that was not possible under our old model of the server just returning us files. User-generated content and personalization. Not only does the website know who we are as a user, but we're also responsible for generating the majority of content that shows up in our everyday um, websites that we visit. Right? It's not other than things like Wikipedia, you can even argue that you know sites like Wikipedia are sites that are just curated, user-generated content. Right? Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Right. Not only are we generating this content, we're interacting with it. Right. That is really something that you know we haven't been able to have until the past decade or so. Is that someone can post something and we can interact with it, we can share it, we can you know comment, we can retweet, we can do whatever whatever it is that everyone does. And finally, we have the web emerging not only as a distributor of content, but also as a distributor of service. And so as I gave the example of uh, PayPal a little bit earlier, and that's just one example of how not only is it that content is being distributed from servers to your to your computers, but also services and other other things are being made available. Um, as, as the web proliferates. And so, I argue that all of this was possible with one key breakthrough that we had, um, I would say in the late 90s and early 2000s, that made all of this possible. And this one key breakthrough is what differentiates fundamentally what we had earlier with static pages, with what we have today, and what we're going to be asking you to build over the next month. Anyone want to guess what that is? Someone say something. 
So when you hear about all of these application frameworks today, like Ruby on Rails and Express and Django, and even some of the ones that no one ever uses anymore, like PHP and Cake and all of that, all of that are examples of the web server running some program. And you can imagine how, yeah, this was 2004, um, the first iteration of Facebook that ran off of a very standard uh, what we call web stack today, um, out of Mark Zuckerberg's dorm room, right? Basically, now what we're doing is anyone who can write some sort of a program can serve dynamic content, and that's just ridiculously powerful. So if we look, if we go back to our early model, we're looking at our server, and really all we're asking our server to do is, within, with, within this model, what we're asking it to do is basically when handling the, the, the connection that we're, we're spamming it with, instead of, instead of you know, just finding a file and giving it back to us, what we're, what we're asking the server to do is we're asking it to run a program. And this program is going to generate a file. That is sort of meta. And it's like, whoa, what just happened? Like, it's like, especially if you first learn HTML, and you think of HTML as some sort of like programming language, sort of like you're writing a program in some programming language to generate some other programming language. It's like, whoa. Um, whoa. Um, but the most important thing to remember here is that it doesn't really ma matter what our program does. You know, most of us have written some sort of program. We we'll fire a Python, print hello world, right? Instead of printing hello world, we print hello world around with p tags, all of a sudden we have HTML. The critical thing here is just that Remember our client-server separation? Our programs just need to generate things that the client understands. And it doesn't really matter what that is. So since we're dealing with browsers, we're going to be generating HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and so on. Cool. Any questions? Whoa, this looks, you know, pretty cool. Big words. And 
remember yesterday, it sounds a little bit like what we're going to make you do over this month. Right? So you all will join in this Web 2.0 revolution, whatever that means. Um, and so, just as a little bit of a recap, we've gone from 1990 to <coughs> the modern day. And we're really, you know, we, we've, we've done a lot. And we've enabled users to do a lot more on our websites. And our websites are really no longer websites where people go there and just simply look at words anymore. Um, it's really a, an application that's built on the platform of the browser. And users treat it like an application, right? You treat things like Gmail and Facebook as an application. It just so happens to run inside your browser window. And so today we're going to talk about one tiny slice of what makes all this possible. And we're just going to talk about the web architecture. We're going to talk about frameworks. And we'll start from there. And then we'll cover the rest of this entire column at some point the rest of this week. But today we'll just start with a, with a very tiny slice. Any questions? Do I need to close this in order for it to work? <laughs> cool. Alright, so things are going to escalate a little bit. I'm going to start talking about nitty gritty details of some architectures. And the first question that we're going to answer is how does this communication happen? What are the low-level details, basically, of when you open up your computer and you send a request to some website? <coughs> Other than Google, because Google's weird. You send a request to some website, what, what happens? And at the bottom of all this is our friend, I'm sure you've heard of it, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And all HTTP does is it sets a standard by which the client and server talk to each other. So I want you to do this. I want you to open up Chrome and open up the inspector. If you don't, um, if you've never used the inspector before, well, and say say hello to it. Um, you'll be using it a lot over the next month. And click on the network tab of the inspector, and then open up your favorite website. How do you get to the inspector? So, if you just open up any website, <coughs> just right click it and then select inspect element, um, and this screen should pop up. And if you're on Firefox, um, use Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> and if, yeah, so if you've loaded a website, um, and you go to network tab, refresh it, you can click on a link. Um, the only caveat I have here is don't use Google, because Google does a lot of magic, and you won't be able to actually see what's going on. So I'll give you guys two minutes to do that. Um, if you're having trouble firing up your inspector, um, can, uh, you can hit Control Shift I if you're on Windows, or Command Option I to open it up. If you can't it work, if you can't work. If you're having trouble opening it up, um, raise your hand. We'll have someone come by and help you with it because you're going to want to know how to open the inspector um, later on. So we might as well get that out of the way now. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and assume most people have opened up a website in the inspector. And if you haven't, raise your hand, shout something at me. Oh, 
fair, Safari's gotten a lot better. Um, I ditched it five years ago after it was real slow, but I think it's gotten better. Um, yeah. So, you might see things like this. Wait, what other browser are people using? Is there anyone using IE here? <laughs> IE6. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I actually re recently read an article on Windows 10, they're no longer going to call it IE, but it's basically going to be the same thing. I think they're finally ditching the brand of IE. It's actually, IE 9 is actually not a bad browser. Uh, Microsoft's no longer a strong response, so I don't have to say that. Um, Alright, so this is when I went to Expedia.com, because I was looking at my flight tickets. Um, so, if you remember, when we would visit a website, there's two components to it, right? There's the request and the response. And the request and the response happen over a single HTTP connection. The browser initiates it, it sends a request to the server, and then the server comes back with a response. And the key thing that I want you to get out of this is that as part of both the request and the response, it's a lot bigger, um, there are these things called headers. HTTP headers. And while you don't have to know what exactly is going on with each one of these headers right now, um, these things are going to be useful because when you end up building your, your website and you're passing data back and forth between client and server, you're going to start seeing things that look very familiar. You know, things that you might have typed into a form appear on these things. Right? And you can see a couple things that you know, look a little bit familiar. Right? You have what I'm telling the server is I want to accept HTML and I'll also accept a bunch of other things um, in English and keep the connection alive and that I am some form of a map and things like that. And the response comes back and it says, okay, um, I gave you a response in English, 26,000 bytes, HTML, a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of cookies, we'll talk about those later. But this is really what's flying back and forth. The, these things are being converted into bits. These things are being flying back and forth on the wire between my computer and the server. So now you might say, OK, we've gotten a single round trip. But oftentimes, a single round trip isn't enough. Right? When you visit a page, it's not like you just visit the page and you're like, OK, cool, I'm done. Right? You probably do things on it. You click on links, you submit forms, you know, chat with people, um, you click buttons, you do all these things. And clearly, when you do all these things, the browser has to do something. A lot of times, it needs to go back to the server, it needs to get more information. And the one critical thing, if you remember nothing from my lecture today, remember this. Does the server remember what we've done in the past? So I'm going to guess. 50-50. The borrows know, but when they establish it, too fancy, but that is correct. Um, okay, I was going to say, I don't know if I can throw this without getting someone, someone in front of you. Um, before it was no, and when they established things like cookies, it was yes. That's pretty accurate. The answer that I want you to walk, walk out of here today is no. And then we're going to add on other things that change that no into a whenever we as a programmer want it. But the critical thing to know here is that HTTPS itself, when we start up a server and when you're just writing your first websites between the browser and the server, the answer is always no. Right? HTTP itself doesn't actually store any information. We have to go in as a programmer and explicitly tell the server to store certain things wherever we want them to be stored. So, and yes, one of those things are cookies. You know, now we have things like sockets, we have server sessions, we have databases, we have a bunch of other things. But no, no, remember that. It'll be a lot easier when you're programming your website and you're like, wait, but I logged in. Why is the server not remembering me? It's like, well, it's not supposed to remember anything. You have to tell it to. Oh, as I just said, um, well, clearly, you know, that's, you know, Charles, you're literally lying to me right now, right? Clearly it does. Every time I, if I go to Facebook and I close my browser, or if I don't close my browser, and I refresh it, clearly it remembers me. It does that somehow. And as I explained, the protocol itself isn't remembering anything. In these messages back and forth between the client and the server, 
unless we explicitly add something to those messages to say, hey server, I am Charles, or hey client, store this thing, the parties involved, the server and the client, aren't going to do that by themselves. So, we're going to talk about these things on Friday. Um, and if you do anything else after take that point away from this lecture, is to come back for this lecture on Friday. And come back for everything in between. But especially this lecture on Friday. Um, and this is how we this is how we start things. So that was a lot of information. Any questions? Oh, most people are most people are doing pretty well. There are some people who have questions. You can ask them. I'm not trying to throw a chocolate at you. Alright, well, if you don't have a question, then I have a question for you. What's this a graph of? That says 3 billion at the top, by the way. Yeah. And number of websites? Number of websites, not quite. Internet users worldwide? Internet users worldwide. There we go. Could be better. <laughs> Alright, very good. Number of internet users in the world from 1993 until today. You can see it's a pretty clear trend. The web is getting more and more important. You're in the right class. What is this a graph of? constrained 
by the methods that we're using to build this website. Because that's really silly. You know, if, if I can envision and I can code really fast, but I'm being slowed down because I have to write you know, 10 lines every time I want to make a database query, it's probably not very optimal. So starting around when you saw the number of websites spike, there was another trend. And that is in the number of web frameworks that have exploded. And you've probably heard of things like Ruby on Rails, Node, Express, Django, Flask. On uh, Zen, the Zen mostly use PHP nowadays, um, and a bunch of other frameworks. Right? And these frameworks allow us to do a bunch of things. They allow us to build features as fast as we can. A lot of times with really crappy code. Um, but it lets us build features and it lets us do it fast. And that's what people want. So, let's go a little bit back to some ideas of yesterday. And we're going to look at it um, a bit from a more technical perspective. Many web apps have very similar functions. Right? A lot of web apps. Think about the web apps that you use every day. Right. What are some of the similarities among them? Like, what do all web apps do? Yeah. Authentication. Authentication. Who is the user? I'm <coughs> gonna try to do this. Oh. Good job. I know it's not breaking your heels. What? <laughs> <laughs> Another brutal game, by the way. Um, any other features? Information sharing. And this has to do with the whole user generated content thing. The user, as sort of the consumer of the web page, is responsible for curating the data on it. Exactly. Try this <coughs> Nice catch. <laughs> One handed. Right. 
model view controller. Um, and I promise you that model view controller in 647D with any web app is orders of magnitude easier than when you had to do model view controller in Java. So that's something to look forward to. Right? We have models which are responsible for the data. We have controllers which are responsible for the interaction. And we have views which are responsible for letting the user view things. And just like you know, all these big words that Professor Miller put up on the board when he introduced model view controller, <coughs> increased modularity, reduced complexity, increased development speed, blah, blah, blah. Um, and one thing you'll see among web programmers is this concept of dry. Don't repeat yourself. So if you ever see yourself writing the same code over and over again, you should be using a framework. Probably think about how that framework will let you not repeat yourself. Um, and again, it's all about development speed. And it's not only just about development speed, it's about consistency. Right? Imagine a site where you know, I have the same nav bar at the top, but on every different page, you know, things are off by a couple of pixels. And that'd be pretty, pretty annoying. So don't repeat yourself. And so for the last 10 minutes or so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very quick overview of how model view controller works on the web. And this is when things start to escalate a little bit quickly. So feel free to shout out, raise your hand if you have any questions. And I'm not going to use any real languages or any real frameworks quite yet. That's for the next couple of lectures. What I'm just going to do here is give you an overall sort of big picture of how pretty much all these frameworks work. Of course, all these frameworks will have their own ways of doing things, but you know, at a high level, they, they all sort of do the same thing. So I'm just going to ignore these. And okay, I'm just going to ignore these and come to my drawing. Here. Um, so this is Victor, and he wants to visit a website. And let's say, so he's on his computer. Um, I'm not an artist. And so let's say he wants to look at his photos on, um, a, on Facebook. So his computer is going to send this request <coughs> to a server, right? And it might take the form of something like, get facebook.com slash, let's just say it's that, facebook.com slash photos slash one, two, three, or something like that. And we've sort of talked about how this, how the internet and all of its magic and, you know, um, DNS and HTTP and all of that take all of these things and it directs this request to the proper server, right? It finds the server and it directs it to it. And so this request is going to make its way, it's going to make its way in these little packets, and it's going to make it into the web server. And this is the web server for Facebook. <coughs> and what Facebook's going to do is the web server is going to take this request and it's going to pass it on to the framework. These are the frameworks that we're interested in studying. And pass it into this framework in a way that the framework will understand and be able to do things. So generally what's going to happen is the server's just going to strip strip the, the address. So now what we have in here is we have, we're doing get of <coughs> photos one, two, three. So far, pretty straightforward. And there's a lot of sort of block magic that goes on here that we're not going to be concerned with. And what we have here is we have two things. We have the get. The get is what's called an HTTP verb. I'll talk about this in just a second. And we have this thing, which is basically what remains of the URL. Photos one, two, three. And these two things are going to get fed into the router. In Node, we're going to call them the router. In Rails, we're going to call them the router plus the controller. Um, every framework has its own way of um, naming things, but there's going to be something which handles the combination of the get and the photos one, two, three. And what it's going to do is this router, this router's sole job is going to be to take these two things right here 
and map that to a function that's going to be run on the server. Right? So when the user types in a URL, what, it, what he's typing in is you know, some, some, some part after URL, photos, IDs, whatever. And the server is going to convert that into a function. And of course, that function is going to be something that we've written on the server. Right? So now that we found that function, so that was some function. What this function is going to do is this function is going to be responsible for constructing the server's response back to the client. And it's going to do, at a high level, two things. And in all of your websites, pretty much, you'll see this pattern in every controller function. It's going to do two things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to make calls to the database. We haven't talked about databases yet, don't worry too much about them. But it's going to do all of the data related things. So maybe we gave it data, we were like, hey, server, store this one. Or maybe we're saying, in this case, I want to get Victor's photo ID one, two, three. And so the server will do some stuff with data. And the second thing it'll do is return <coughs> HTML to the server. And I said I wouldn't write any code, but I sort of wrote some code. <coughs> so you'll, you'll see more of this um, in David's lecture this afternoon. You'll, get, you'll see a bunch of these things. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to match this right here to one of those functions. Right? We're going to match, so we're going to have get photos with some number afterwards. You know, exactly one of those matches. <coughs> that matches. And then we're going to run the function that it has afterwards. And again, you'll see more concrete code in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to skip here, post, and delete. Uh, basically, you can read up on this if, you, if you're interested. Uh, basically, there's these four HTTP birds that tell the server what to do. And there's a great Wikipedia page that tells you when to use them. And it's pretty boring. So now we have a model we control. Right? We have a model, which stores, manipulates, enhances back data. We have a controller, which you know, is sort of like the glue of all this. It handles the user request, and it delegates to the appropriate code. And we have the view, which is ultimately what we want to get back. Right? When we make this request, what we want is we want the server to come back with, say, hey, here's, here's the photo that you requested. And the way the views are um, sort of written is they're written in these things called templates. And they look a little bit intimidating with all the brackets and stuff. Uh, but what it really comes down to is it's HTML with a bunch of placeholders. And the controller, <coughs> remember when I said the controller <coughs> would get data? Well, it's going to get this data. It's going to maybe manipulate it in some way. And it's going to ship that data off to the view. And so, you know, I might have this template that says, hello, Charles, and here's your picture. And the controller is going to construct that object right there that has name and image URL. And you'll see that these things are just going to get stored directly where those little angle bracket percent sign things are. And there we have it, a complete HTML template. How many people are still following me?
Uh, we'll do uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I have a brief primer on Git development environments for those of you who haven't really done much coding before. And then we'll dive into our first web framework. Um, take this time in addition to learning. <coughs> take this time to install some things. If you haven't installed Git yet and you haven't installed Node, Node.js, um, we've given links to both of the installations. So feel free to install. Um, and if you have any questions, just uh,